In this video, we're going to cover an introduction to pharmaceutics, looking at an overview of the key terms, drugs, excipients, and medicines. And then in later pharmaceutics lectures, we'll expand on these topics. But before we start this lecture, be a sweet neuron and subscribe to the channel. Once you've done that, let's start this lecture by first understanding what we study in pharmaceutics and what exactly it is. Okay, so pharmaceutics focuses on the conversion of a drug into a medicine. We're interested in the design, formulation, manufacture, and evaluation of medicines. We're transforming a drug into safe, effective, and stable dosage forms that patients can use. But what exactly do we mean by drugs? So a drug is defined as a chemical substance used to manage or treat diseases in plants, animals, and humans. Essentially, it's an external chemical that when introduced into the body produces a physiological effect or alters bodily functions. This term, however, I want to say it can be ambiguous and, be, and may be interpreted differently by different people. And so in the pharmaceutical industry, to avoid this confusion, we often use alternative terms for drug. These include pharmacological agent, active ingredient, or active pharmaceutical ingredient, API. We often refer to drugs as APIs or active ingredients. These are the substances within a medication that produces the desired therapeutic effect. Now let's look at two key characteristics of a drug, specificity and potency. So now let's subtract complexity and go through what specificity is. So specificity refers to a drug's ability to target particular receptors or biological molecules in the body. For a drug to be effective, it must interact with specific targets such as proteins, enzymes, or receptors, modifying physiological or biochemical processes through specific chemical interactions such as covalent bonds or electrostatic interactions. Okay, so a drug's ability to bind to its target depends on both the drug and the target's structure. When it binds, it can either activate or block the target's function, causing a biological response. Beautiful. So the specificity of a drug is important for its effectiveness, as it determines how well the drug interacts with its intended receptor. Different receptors, of course, respond at different speeds. For example, we have ligand-gated ion channels. These are the fastest, reacting in milliseconds. This quick response happens because the ligand here, take a look at this, directly opens or closes the ion channel, causing immediate changes in the cell, like hyperpolarization or depolarization. There aren't any intermediate signaling step. It just opens or closes an ion channel, okay? There are no intermediate signaling steps. Open, close. Whereas if the active ingredient or the API needs to adjust, let's say, the ATP levels, the effect may be relatively quick, but it can still take some time to observe noticeable changes. So if the drug, okay, if the drug has to enter, let's say, the nucleus and change gene expression, the effects will be much slower and may not be seen for hours or even days, right? Now, here's the thing. Just because a drug binds to a receptor, it doesn't mean it will activate it, okay? So drugs that bind and activate receptors are called agonists, okay? Agonists are drugs that bind, and when they bind, they activate a receptor, and it causes a biological response. While antagonists can bind to the receptor, but it doesn't activate it. So an agonist triggers the receptor, while an antagonist simply binds without causing activation. And this is pretty cool once we get into, into it, right? Okay, so that's specificity. We're going to talk about that in later pharmaceutics lectures. Another important characteristic that I want to talk about is potency. So potency refers to the amount of drug needed to produce a physiological effect, and it's measured by the EC50 value. So this value represents the drug concentration required to achieve 50% of maximum response. To understand potency better, we use concentration response curves, CRCs, which show the relationship between a drug's concentration and its biological effects. We cover CRCs in more detail in the drug receptor interactions lecture linked below. So if you want to check that out, go ahead. 
But in a CRC, the drug concentration is plotted on the x-axis, and the response, which can it can refer to various measured effects, is on the y-axis here. Now, as the concentration increases, the response also increases, right? So the resulting graph is typically sigmoidal, with the linear portion of the curve occurring between 20 and 80% of the maximum response. For therapeutic drugs, the linear region is the therapeutic range, where the drug produces the desired effect, okay? So increasing the dose within this range leads to a stronger response. Below this range here, this is the sub-therapeutic area where the drug's effect is too weak. Now, the EC50 is the drug concentration at which 50% of the maximum response is achieved. In the graph, the maximum response is 100%. And the, lin and the line that crosses the curve of 50% indicates the EC50. So this is the concentration needed to reach half of the maximum effect. Maximum effect. The EC50 is the drug concentration that gives 50% of the maximum response, okay? It's a value on the x-axis of the graph, not the percentage of the response. So the potency of a drug is measured by the EC50 value. Okay, what does this mean then? If a drug has a high potency, it means that a lower concentration of the drug is sufficient to achieve the desired effect. On the other hand, a drug with low potency requires a higher concentration to produce the same effect. So a lower EC50 means the drug is more potent, right? This means a potent drug needs a smaller dose to produce the same effect. So for example, drug A has an EC50 of two. So it needs a concentration of two molar, Drug B has a higher EC50 of 6, needing 6 molar, and the drug C with an EC50 of 30 needs 30 molar. Drugs with lower EC50 values are more potent, okay, shown on the left side of the curve here. They need fewer drug molecules or a lower concentration to produce the same effect. And this is clear when we're looking at the maximum response. Drug A reaches its full effect at a much lower concentration than drug B or C. And drugs with lower, with lower potency require a higher concentration of the drug to produce the same effect. And they have a high EC50 and will appear on the right side, on the right side of the CRC. Beautiful. Another great way to explain this, if it's still a bit overwhelming, don't worry, let's explain it in a different way. I like to explain it as imagine three chefs, okay? Each chef uses different amounts of special, spe special, special seasoning to create a flavorful dish, right? The chefs repre represent different drugs and the amount of seasoning reflects drug potency. Okay, bear with me here. Chef A is highly potent, using just a tiny sprinkle to achieve full flavor, right? Chef B needs moderate amount and then Chef C, the least potent, requires large amount to reach the same flavor. Now, if we plot the seasoning amount on the x-axis and the dish's flavor on the y-axis, we get a concentration response curve. So Chef A's curve starts low, rises quickly, and then levels off, reaching maximum flavor with little seasoning. Chef A's EC50 is low, meaning it takes less seasoning to reach 50% of the maximum flavor. Whereas Chef B, Chef B needs a bit more seasoning to reach the same level of flavor. So it's EC50 is higher. Chef C's, okay, so that was Chef B. Chef C's curve starts high, rises slowly, and then levels off at the highest flavor with the highest EC50, meaning it requires the most seasoning for 50% of the maximum flavor, right? It's just chucking and putting so much more seasoning compared to Chef A and Chef B to achieve 50% of the maximum flavor. So in this analogy, the potency of the chefs represents the potency of drugs and the seasoning amount correlates with the drug concentration, okay? So a good example of this, let's apply it to, I guess, real life, is comparing two substances. We have ethanol and 
histamine. Ethanol is effective at blood concentration between 0.01 and 0.1 molar. Its effects depend on the amount consumed. At moderate levels, ethanol can lower inhibitions and affect nerve signaling, causing relaxation and increased sociability, right? However, higher concentrations can impair judgment and coordination. So despite these effects, ethanol, it's not very potent as it requires larger amounts to produce noticeable changes in the body, unless you're a lightweight, right? <laughs> Just kidding. In contrast, histamine is much more potent. So even in small amounts, histamine can trigger allergic reactions like itching, tearing, and sneezing, right? So if you have hay fever, you know exactly what I mean. So this comparison shows specificity and potency. Again, let's go through it. Let's summarize it. Specificity refers to a drug's ability to target specific receptors or biological systems, while potency indicates how much of the drug is needed to produce an effect. Histamine is more potent than ethanol because it produces a strong response at much lower concentrations. Now, it's important to remember that APIs or active ingredients and drugs can have side effects. So side effects are unwanted or secondary effects that occur along with the intended therapeutic effects. So for example, a good example is aspirin. So when not used correctly or taken in excess, it can cause serious side effects like gastric bleeding, ulcers, or kidney damage. All right, now that we understand what an API or drug is, let's talk about how medicines are developed. Okay, this is beautiful. Most active ingredients are handled as solid powders since these substances are often highly potent, only small amounts, sometimes milligrams or even micrograms are needed to produce a therapeutic effect. Now, the question is, why aren't drugs administered as pure chemicals? Why can't we just give it just it is, right? Just as pure chemicals. The first reason is, like we've spoken about, potency. Because only very small amounts are needed to achieve a therapeutic effect, asking a patient to weigh out something like 100 milligrams can lead to inaccuracies, right? So this imposition can result in side effects as it's challenging to measure to measure such tiny quantities accurately. Imagine you're like, you know, you go to a chemist and they're like, yep, yeah, okay, here you go, measure 100 milligrams. Can lead to inaccuracies, okay? The second reason relates to bioavailability and pharmacokinetics. So recall what bioavailability means, which is a measure of how effectively a drug is absorbed and available for action. It's the fraction of the administered drug that reaches the bloodstream unchanged. Now, many drugs degrade quickly once they enter the body, which can cause rapid release and effects. So in medicine, it's crucial to control how a drug acts to avoid periods of overdose or underdose. Okay, that's the second reason. What's the third? The third reason is stability. So this refers not only to how a drug behaves in the body, but it's also its stability in its powdered form or stored in a bottle, right? So many drugs undergo chemical or biological degradation over time, even at room temperature. So it's important to minimize this degradation. So for these three key reasons, we have potency, bioavailability, and stability, drugs are not provided as pure chemicals. Instead, they are formulated and administered as medicines. And this is where pharmaceutics come in, okay? So pharmaceutics is the science of converting a drug into a usable medicine. It involves transforming a pure chemical, known for its potency and specificity, everything that we covered early in the lecture, into a formulation that patients can safely take, ensuring reliable and controlled effects with minimal side effects, okay? Now, the process of this conversion requires the expertise of pharmaceutical scientists who focus on creating stable medications that maintain their effectiveness. All right, so now when we talk about medicines, it's important to note that they contain more than just the active ingredient. They also include substances known as excipients. An excipient is a pharmacologically inactive substance that serves as a vehicle or medium for the active ingredient. 
Now, excipients can be categorized into three main groups. Preparation, these excipients assist in the manufacturing process. So for example, we have glidants are used in tablet formulations to improve powder flow during tablet compression. Functional, so some excipients enhance the drug's performance. An example is enteric coating, which protects you know, acid-sensitive drugs from stomach acidity, ensuring they remain effective until they reach the intestines. And then we have patient acceptability. So this category includes excipients that improve the overall experience for patients, particularly for oral formulation. So we have coloring agents, flavoring agents, and sweeteners are commonly added to make medicines more palatable, make them taste a bit not, like nicer, okay, to mask the disgusting taste of it, right? But each excipient serves as a specific purpose in a pharmaceutical product. And the choice of excipient depends on the product's requirements. It's essential that, that excipients are non-toxic, non-sensitizing, and non-irritating, ensuring compatibility with all the other components of the formulation. Okay? So overall, while excipients are pharmacologically inactive, they play a very, very important role in determining how a drug functions. So for instance, consider the role of a diluent. So diluents are commonly included in the tablet formulations to increase the dose quantity, right? And a widely used diluent is lactose. So when incorporated into tablets, lactose facilitates rapid drug release due to its quick disintegration properties. This results in a faster onset of action for the medication, making it effectively in making it effective shortly after ingestion. Okay, on the other hand, if we replace if we replace lactose with hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose or HPMC, which is a polymer often used in extended release formulations, we can significantly alter the drug release profile. So what happens with HPMC is it swells over time allowing for a gradual release of the drug from the tablet. So this slower release can be beneficial for medications that need to maintain a consistent therapeutic effect over a longer time or a longer period. So by changing the diluent, we can change how a drug is released from a tablet, whether it's fast release or slow release, right? So therefore, think about excipients as a very important part of our medicine here. Despite being pharmacologically inactive, they are essential in shaping how medicines work and how they are delivered.